So we have begun every message in this series uh, by praying the Lord's Prayer. So I'm going to ask you to do that again this morning and let's lift our voice. If you don't have it committed to memory, that's fine. It's, it's up on the screen for you. Uh, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The message that I'm uh, talking about today is actually I originally planned for next uh, Sunday. And I've taken it out of order because there have been some things that have been happening in national news that have provided an incredible opportunity for us to be able to think about how we pray about such things. I think a lot of people, when they see things that happen in places like Haiti or Afghanistan, they assume that they don't have any influence on anything that happens outside of their house or the place that they work, or the neighborhood that they live in. Lots of people assume that there's not even any spiritual responsibility to anything outside of what we walk in and out of on a daily basis. Consequently, we only see what our culture and the media present to us, and our emotions can be impacted, and we can have reflexes, but a lot of times our reflexes are not the reflex of prayer and intercession. A lot of times our reflexes are just a shaking of the head, a concern about something, uh, maybe even feeling bad, but not really knowing if there's any action to take. There's a famous experiment. You can actually look it up online and, and see it for yourself but it reveals how selective our attention can be. We only pay attention to the things that we're focused on. And our culture does an amazing job telling us what to focus on. The media does an amazing job telling us what to focus on. So the experiment goes like this. They take people and they have them watch a screen and on the screen is a basketball team that comes out on a basketball court and they pass the ball back and forth to each other. It's a passing drill and the people who are watching the screen are told, I want you to count the number of passes that are made between the basketball players. And when they get done with that, they ask them for the number. Most people get it right, and they give the number of the number of passes, and then they ask them, did you see the gorilla? And people go, what gorilla? And they play the video back, and when they play the video back in the middle, it's not like just something off to the side. While the ball is being passed back and forth, a person in a gorilla suit walks into the middle of the basketball court, looks directly at the camera, pounds its chest several times, and storms off the court. And 50% of all people who watched the video never saw him. Now I know everyone in this room would be in the 50% who would have seen him. But you can actually look that up. At least 50% who participated in the experiment didn't see the gorilla. Our culture is very good at calling attention to specific things. But I wonder what we're missing with our selective attention. This is what it says in Matthew 26, beginning in verse 40. Jesus returned to his disciples. He found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing. It's the flesh that is weak. How we speak reveals what we see. Our tendency is to talk about the things that we have seen. When it comes to spiritual things, there are a number of people who don't 
notice some things that are happening right in front of them. We're like the 50% who didn't see the gorilla because we're focused on other things. How do you know that that's true? Because of what people say. You can tell what people aren't seeing and what they are seeing by what they're saying. What you see determines what you say. If we sound like everything else in culture, it's because we're only seeing what they're pointing to us. And as, as people of God's kingdom, we're actually called to see something different and say something different in our world. And so many believers fall into the trap of just repeating what we've seen on our favorite channels, on our favorite media outlets, on our favorite personalities. There is an opportunity to see something that others are not seeing and say something that others are not saying. And as it turns out, that has a huge influence in the world in which we live. A spiritual perspective is more than a different opinion. This is not asking you to have a different opinion about things. It isn't just a different opinion about the events that are going on in our world around us. It isn't just seeing something through rose-colored glasses. You just need a more positive attitude. Just, just do that. That's not what it's about. It's, it's more about seeing what is less obvious, but it's there. And when we say something about it, it makes a difference. For example, there are some things you can't see in darkness. We are called to be a light in the darkness. That's what Jesus tells us we are. So I understand there's some things we can't see in the dark world, but we're not just walking in darkness. We're supposed to be a light in the darkness. And it isn't so much about exposing things that are going on because some followers of Christ consider that their full-time job. It's more about revealing what's happening in the world around us. It's not just identifying what's at risk, which people are really good at. It's also being able to sense what is possible. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I, I got a piece of metal in my eye and they had to put uh, uh, some medication in it and they had to let it heal and they didn't want it to get scratched so they put a patch over my eye and I ran around with that for a little while and what I will tell you is I discovered that uh, your depth perception is considerably compromised when you only have one eye if you don't believe me you can try it for a day and see how many things you walk into unintentionally uh, it just happens uh, we're supposed to have a spiritual insight to our world and there's a kind of depth perception we lose when we don't see through that eye. So Jesus had a recommendation in his conversation with his followers. And what he says is this, keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. Watch. When, when he says the word watch, what he means is be alert. Pay attention to what is going on around you. And then he says this, keep an open dialogue with, with God. Keep the conversation going with God. Watch and pray. Start a conversation with God so that you can understand what's going on and you can understand how to respond to it. A lot of times we assume we know how to pray about something. And, and Romans actually tells us, Paul, when he wrote to the Roman church, he tells us this, we often don't know how to pray as we ought. But you can actually ask God for assistance, and he will give you insight to things you didn't notice before, and it will help form how you talk or pray about those things in your conversations with him. So here's an experiment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, a little challenge I'm going to put out to you. Let's see how many take it up, all right? Here's the challenge. Make a commitment this week. I will not talk to someone about what I have seen in the news or on social media until I've talked to God about it first. Do you think that might impact anybody's posting? I'm pretty sure. Uh, Jesus saw differently than everyone else. And he said different things than everyone else. And that's why even if you don't believe he's the son of God, you cannot avoid the impact he's had on our world and our cultures. You cannot deny that. In Matthew 7, th this is what he says. He says, you think you can see the little speck in someone else's eye and you don't see the huge plank that's in your own eye. He could, he could see that. Uh, it's so easy to, to look at life from a judgmental perspective, but that's just self-righteousness. That's all that is. 
And it's so easy to be able to find faults in others without ever noticing anything about our own shortcomings. In Matthew 14, the disciples were looking at the size of the crowd and the little bit of food they had. And they were panicking because Jesus has said, we need to feed this crowd. And they said, we, we, no, that's not an option. It's not possible. Send them home. And Jesus didn't look at the crowd and he didn't look at the food. The Bible says in Matthew 14, he looked to heaven and he saw something different. And the result is an entire multitude got fed. When Jesus looked at a herd of sheep, he didn't just see the 99 that were safe in the fold. He saw the one who wandered away. When Jesus looked at a rich young ruler who looks as though he has everything he needs in life, he noticed the one thing that he was still lacking. When Jesus looked at, the, at, at humanity, he said they're like fields who are ripe for harvest. The disciples could see hard times. Jesus could see harvest time. It makes a big difference what we see. When Jesus, this is what Jesus said. He said, I only say the things that God tells me to say, his father tells him to say, and I only do the things that he shows me. He was seeing something differently. We do not naturally see what God sees. And that is why we do not naturally say what God says. And our world desperately needs to hear those words. We see headlines. And, and uh, I'm not after, I'm not hunting anybody down. So if you feel uh, pinched a little bit right now, just consider that maybe some conviction of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Um, we'll see a headline in the newspaper and we may wonder how that will affect our political party and whether it will help our favorite team win or lose an election. Um, and people will actually say things like, well, if that person is elected, our country will be lost. They're, they're basing that on what they see. How do you think a headline will affect my financial position? If I lose money, I may lose my security. Or uh, maybe how will a lack of a job, you will see some information about jobs and, and unemployment. I wonder how that's going to affect me. And then we're worried we may lose our identity because we're not able to do the thing that we are trained to do or that we enjoy doing. Could it be, could it be that we're just simply not seeing what God sees? And that's why we're not saying what God says. Could it be that we're looking at lesser things for our identity and our security and our prosperity? It's a, it's a form of spiritual nearsightedness. And it's revealed by our language. The absence of alertness and conversations with God make us susceptible to temptation. Jesus says, watch and pray so you won't fall into temptation. When pressure is increasing, we will be tempted to flee, to escape. When pressure is increasing, we will be tempted to hide the truth or lie about the truth. When pressure is increasing, we will be tempted to remain silent when saying something could actually help make a difference. If you could see what your marriage could be, it will change how you talk to God. We look at our marriage and we just see how bad it is. And that, that kind of carries the conversation. And, and we, do, uh, we do a commentary. Uh, I, I like watching football. I watched the Bills play uh, yesterday. And if you didn't see the game, spoiler alert, they did really, really well. And uh, if you've been a Bills fan as long as I have, those are really enjoyable occasions. And there are people who are commentating, and all they do is they talk about what they just saw someone do on the field. And sometimes our prayers are nothing more than commentaries about what we have seen in our marriage or what we have seen in our world instead of having some kind of insight as to what God would want to do. How would your prayers change if you could see what God wanted to do in your 
your marriage? How would your prayers change if you could see what God wanted to do in the lives of your children and your grandchildren? How could your prayers change? How would they change if you could see how God sees the influence that you carry in the world? It will make a huge difference in what we say. If we don't see it, our language betrays it. There's just things we won't say. And this isn't about superstitious things. Just don't say negative things so bad things won't happen. That's not what it's about. It's a call to open our eyes, to pay attention, to be alert to what God wants to show us so that when we say something, it's absolutely different than everything we're hearing in the world around us. Amen? Amen. God will show you things by his spirit. So that's the question. Where are we supposed to find these things? Where are we supposed to see these things? And the answer is God shows them to us by his spirit. Uh, among the evidences of the Holy Spirit listed in Scripture for us, both in the book of Joel and repeated in the book of Acts, is that God will give people visions and dreams. Now, visions and dreams are not things that, they're not holograms that are standing in front of you. It, it's, it's, not, it's not time travel so that you're seeing something in real time and then coming back to talk about it. It's, a, it's an insight. It's a picture of what could be. And God gives that because he wants us to see things that are different than what we're seeing with our natural eyes. Visions and dreams can show us a lot more than we see on our little screens. And I know you may be sitting here going, Pastor, my screen is not little. It's huge. It might be, but compared to what God wants to show us, what God wants to show you won't fit on that screen. Our blindness makes us either victims or it makes us willing participants in the devolution of humanity. People talk about we're evolving, we're getting better. It feels to me like we're devolving. Does anybody else get a sense of that? You know, a lot of people are complaining about a lot of things. There's reasons for that. And when temptation comes, we wind up falling for it simply because we don't have anything else at all we don't see anything else differently, and we don't say anything else differently. This is how Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except for the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak. See? God shows us by his spirit. This is what we speak. Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the spirit. The person with the spirit makes judgments. I'm going to come back to that word in just a minute. The person with the spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. When it talks about judgments, it's not talking about blaming. Looking for who's to blame will limit your prayer. Looking for what God will do will enrich your prayer. We're kind of built in to identify whose fault something is. And that actually won't help your prayer life very much. The person with the Spirit makes judgments. It's not about being judgmental. It's not about blaming others for what's wrong. It's, it's, and by the way, blaming others for what's wrong is not evidence of spiritual maturity. It's the first thing fallen humans do in Scripture. Right after they fell and they disobey God, the first thing they do is they start blaming other people. And every human sense has continued that kind of dialogue. We just find fault and point it out as though that's going to fix things. It's what humans do. Paul is referring to having discernment. He's referring to making evaluations. What forces are at work and what's going on in front of me? What's happening spiritually? What is God doing? Where is he active? Who is being negatively impacted? What options are necessary in order for things to improve? 
So here's a daily prayer that you could pray. Heavenly Father, show me what you see and help me know how to pray. You want a really interesting prayer life? I know some people's prayer lives get boring. I won't ask you to raise your hand if, if, you're, if your prayer life has ever been boring. I won't ask you to raise your hand if any message I've ever preached has ever been boring. I won't ask you to raise your hand if this message is boring. But you would be surprised what starts coming to your mind when you say, Heavenly Father, show me what you see and help me know how to pray. And, and a really interesting thing to do is after you pray that, just take something you can write down, the ideas and the thoughts that come to your mind and pay attention to those and then let that become a focus of your prayer for the day. It's absolutely amazing what will happen to you. Take notes on that. So we're going to make this a little bit practical because there have been so many things that have been hitting the headlines over the last uh, couple of uh, few days and specifically related to Haiti and Afghanistan. Haiti is, uh, had a 7.2 earthquake. That is uh, hugely significant. Roughly half a million people in Haiti have been significantly negatively impacted uh, by that earthquake. There's about 11 million population in the country, but uh, over half a million have been negatively impacted by this. And, and so how can we pray? By the way, in addition to that, uh, you may remember just uh, on July 7th, uh, the president of Haiti was assassinated. And right after that, the entire parliament was dissolved. It's literally a country without leadership right now. And they just had a hurricane that went whizzing by them and added insult to the injury of all the brokenness that took place. And it is so easy to look at something like that. Jeez, you know, they, they, they assassinated, oh, the government, is, oh, look, the earthquake, oh, the hurricane. And we just, we just our reflex is just, to, oh, man, I'm, I'm so glad I don't live there. And that's all the world is really capable of showing us. But what could God show us? We could pray that there is an availability of emergency supplies. We could pray for, a tech, for protection from additional hurricanes. I don't know if you think this is possible or not. I happen to think it's possible for God just to put his hand right down on a path of a hurricane and move it over a little bit so it doesn't go right over the top of Haiti and add all uh, kinds of destruction to the destruction they've already had. Does, it, does anybody else in the room think that God's capable of something like that? I, I'm not saying we can control it, but how many know it's okay to ask God for it? And, and then we could pray for things like fair and equitable distribution of the resources that are available because without good leadership in the country, that can be a really difficult thing. And we can pray for redemptive communities to minister and serve people who have gone through incredible suffering and loss. Like there are churches, there are believers, there are pastors, there, there are people who are part of, they're followers of Christ and they're everywhere located, dispersed all through Haiti. Wouldn't it be great if God could use each and every one of them to make a difference in someone else's life? Life. It makes a huge difference. We can pray that wise leadership will be given the opportunity to lead. We can pray for the protection of those leaders who are wise and who are humble. We can pray for the corruption that is existing in that country to be rooted out so that every dollar that's intended to help someone actually winds up helping someone. How many think that could all be good things to pray? How many think that might be better things to talk about than just saying, oh, geez, I'm so glad I'm not those people. This is why we're here. We're not just observers of the news. We don't just have commentary on what our culture shows us. We invade the darkness and the brokenness of our world by seeing things other people are not seeing and saying things that other people are not saying. And that becomes the windows of opportunity for God's grace and power to flow into the most needed areas in our world. And you don't have to know anybody in Haiti to pray for somebody in Haiti. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. All right. Afghanistan. Oh, I mean, the, the whole government fell within days. And it's so easy to, to, to look at that and just be frustrated. 20-year commitment by the United States, billions of dollars out of treasury, the loss of, of American lives. And, uh, uh, and, and so who's vulnerable? Women and children are very vulnerable there right now. Not to mention boys that will become radicalized. 
Uh, there are people trying to flee because they befriended the efforts of the United States to rebuild their community. And the result is, is now their target. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but there's actually some of those refugees that will be relocated in Rochester, New York. We're actually trying to put together a team of people that would be able to befriend them and be a neighbor to them so that when they get here, some of the first people who meet them are people who see things differently than other people see them and say things differently than other people say them. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Yeah. Uh, Christ followers and Christian leaders who are in that country, some of them will be scattered and some of them will stay. We could pray for connections for those who need to leave and protection for those who stay. We could pray that communities, communities act in a way to protect women and children who are at increased risk. I understand who the ruling forces are in that country now. But I also know that sometimes there are other people in a community who when they know others are coming towards their, their, the, the boundaries and the borders of their city or their region, they know who to hide and where to hide them. How many would love to see those people have that kind of courage in that moment instead of just wringing their hands and saying there's nothing that they can do? We can pray for believers who remain to live out their faith courageously. Some of them are going to lose their lives. Some of them are going to lose their lives for no other reason than they name in the name of Jesus. And it'd be very easy for us to be incensed about that or wring our hands about that. But there was a guy by the name of, of, of Stephen who was stoned. He lost his life. You can read about it in the book of Acts. He was stoned and he lost his life because of his faith in Christ. And there was another person standing by whose name was Saul. And he began a transformation in his life. He winds up becoming the Apostle Paul. I'm asking that for every single person who loses their life in Afghanistan because of their faith that God will raise up a thousand people who will stand in the name of Jesus and evangelize an entire region of the world. That's a different thing to see. That's a different thing to say. We can pray for multitudes in Afghanistan to come to faith in Christ so they can experience God's grace for themselves. We can pray, oh, this is something. We can pray for the hearts of Taliban leaders to be softened. I know there's some people, I, the only prayer I'm going to pray for a Taliban leader is, the, is, is, is for God to let a drone fall out of heaven and get them. Uh, okay. Maybe there's some other things we could pray. I will tell you, I was challenged about this by God. I was, I was sitting in my favorite chair to, to think and pray. And I came across information. It actually showed the names and pictures of the leaders of Taliban in Afghanistan. And my first reaction was frustration and fear. And then I felt this gentle whisper, why don't you pray for them? And I, I think we would all go, why would I pray for them? Proverbs 21 says that the Lord's, in the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water and that he can channel towards all who please him. Matthew 5 tells us to pray for those who persecute us. 1 Timothy 2 tells us, I urge you then, first of all, to, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all of those who are in authority. It didn't just say for the people you agree with, who are in authority. We can pray. Look at what it goes on to say. And all those in authority so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. Wouldn't it be great if as we imagine how things are going to turn out in that part of the world, that God would soften the hearts of some of those key leaders, leaders and there would be people in Afghanistan who would be able to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And this is what it says. When that happens, this is good. And it pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved. How many people? 
all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. We can pray for, you know, there are people who've given significant parts of their lives in, in Afghanistan and maybe even some families who the person in their family that went there gave their life and it's very easy to feel like it's all wasted. It makes no difference. And what I hope that they can see is that it's not a waste. They provided at least two decades of a different kind of way for lots of people to live. They saw something else that was possible. And we can pray for boys to grow to be loving and discerning men who care for their families and their communities instead of being radicalized into something else. We can pray for those things. So I'm gonna have worship team come out. And um, it, the easiest thing for me to do right now is just go. So let's, let's call it a day and go home and, and, and try to do some of that when you get home. And that's not what we're gonna do this morning. We're actually gonna pray. We're going to say something different than you heard on the news or social media or in conversations at the diner with friends. We're going to say something different. And I'm going to ask you to make your prayer really simple. Um, it's not the complicated verbiage or how long we talk that moves heaven. It's the invitation of a heavenly, to a heavenly father just saying, we need help. And I think you've shown me something. And so for me, I, I cannot get out of my mind seeing pictures of Taliban leaders and a, and a picture of what looks like the heart of the father just reaching down and touching hearts and making them soft. It doesn't matter how they're dressed doesn't matter what language they speak. You've never met the person who's beyond the reach of a heavenly father. Wouldn't that be good? So I'm going to ask us all to stand. And I'm going to ask you to speak loud enough for your own voice to hear. And we're going to have, I think there were about seven points of prayer for Haiti. We're going to start there. And then there were seven points of prayer for Afghanistan, and we'll go to there, and I'll announce when we're making the shift. But here's what I want you to do. Just look up on the screen and so pray for available emergency supplies. Like that, that's the first thing on the top of the screen. And so all, all you have to do, and, and I'm going to ask that we don't just stand and pray. Our posture reveals something about how seriously we take a thing. And so I'm going to ask us to extend our hands towards heaven. And, and your prayer can be as simple as this. Father, there are resources already released. Will you please make sure they get into the hands of people who desperately need them? And then right on to the next thing. You pray for protection of leaders who are wise and humble. You can just pray. God, in a, in a place that, that is absence of leadership right now, raise people up. And that's all it has to be, just something as simple as that. And they're going to go back and forth uh, on the slides but, uh, so that you can see all seven things. And we're just going to take about a minute, so I'm not taking a long time. If you want to pray a long time, you can take this list home and, and, and pray for them there. But let's just lift our hands towards heaven. You are seeing something different, and you have the opportunity to say something different, and it's going to have a huge impact in our world. So let's lift our voice right now and begin to pray for Haiti. Let's lift our voice. Call on God. Call out the need. Say it. Say it out loud. Let's move on to Afghanistan. And there are things that we can pray for Afghanistan. So like connection and protection of those who partnered with the US. Just, just you know, it, the prayer can be as simple as 
if there's someone who is able to help them, help them find their name, help them find their address, help them make that connection so that they can find a different place to live. But for those who have to remain, we can just, God, just please protect those who are there uh, supernaturally protect those who are there. So let's just lift our hands right now. There'll be a couple of slides for Afghanistan. Let's just lift our hands. See something different. Say something different. Let's use our voices right now. While, while I was praying, I just wanted to say something different because I saw something different. What I saw was a Taliban leader who's been given great power and great responsibility. And I saw him sitting in a chair and tears were running down his face. We never think of that, do we? We always see hardness and tears running down his face because he could see the vulnerable differently than he had seen them before. Here's what I want you to know. If we will pray for people like that, it's entirely possible that God will help them see something different than they have ever seen. And now they will say something different than they have ever said. Father, we ask right now that your hand would move in Haiti, your hand would move in Afghanistan and that you would be at work in lives and in organizations so that your name would be known. We ask this in Jesus name and everyone who agreed with those prayers said, amen. Let's lift our voice in praise right now. <laughs>